Hello everyone, in this video we are going to discuss how to play the Budapest Gambit. It is a gambit that is played from the black side and I'm pretty sure that many of the viewers watching the video already know about this Budapest Gambit. But today's video is going to be special and it's going to be no ordinary Budapest Gambit but some deviations, some sidelines which can definitely help you to improve your game and also to score some heavy good points in your tournament games. So if you really want to beat your friends at the game of chess, make sure to watch the video till the end. So let's quickly jump into the video. So we are playing with the black pieces and our opponent starts the game with 1d4. We play knight to f6, c4 and here there are many ways for black to continue the position. We have c5, the Benoni, we have e6, the standard, we have g6, the king's Indian and many more. Uh, but after c4, we are going to play the move e5. And this position is also known as the Budapest Gambit. Here after e5, what black is doing here is simply sacrificing a pawn by playing the move e5. White captures the pawn. Okay, if white doesn't capture the pawn or push the pawn, it's already a bad move because here black can happily develop the bishop via c5 and there is no poison in this position. Black can play happily, short castle, g6, maybe pull the knight back to, sorry about that, e8 and play the move f5 and you are having a good position. So going back, so after e5 the main move is d into e5 so we are going to focus on that. After d into e5, the common way to play the Budapest Gambit and what the main line is to play the move knight to g4. So basically the idea is to capture the pawn on e5. So white usually plays knight f3, we play bishop to c5, attacking the f2 pawn, white plays e3, we play knight c6 and we eventually get this e5 pawn back and it's an equal position, white is having slight advantages or uh, the basic purpose of white is to play on the queen side and black is white is extremely fine. So this is how the normal Budapest Gambit is played. But at the place of knight g4 today, we are going to play the move knight to e4. And this, mm, I'm, I'm not sure that many of you, how many of the viewers have seen this position, but I have seen this position for the first time. After knight e4, what's happening? After knight e4, I've placed my knight at an awkward square, I would say, but it's still in the center of the board. And the, if your pieces are in the center of the board, it is considered the most strongest pieces. So after knight e4, my knight is pretty much centralized. So I've taken many options for white side in this position, which is f3, a3, knight to f3, queen to c2, and knight to d2. These five moves I have taken into consideration and we are going to check it one by one. So after knight to e4, if white plays the move f3, logical trying to hit this knight, it's already a blunder. We can start the game with queen to h4 check. A g3 is a forced move. We can simply sacrifice the knight. It's a pr pretty obvious theme. Pawn takes and now we can simply capture the rook and we are winning the game. So this is one way. If you want to do something else, at the place of queen h4 check, you're also having the move bishop to b4 check. If knight to c3, you can already capture this knight and we can simply get the rook in exchange. And if at the place of knight c3, if white plays bishop d2, we can play the move queen h4 check now, g3 and we can simply capture the pawn. The point is, if white plays the move bishop into b4, knight to, d, knight to e4 and the game is over, it's a checkmate. And if white captures the knight as well, we can still capture the pawn this time and it's a checkmate because the d2 square is covered by the bishop. So this is how you can play if your opponent responds with f3. So now let's try to discuss what happens if your opponent plays the move a3. After a3, what's the idea? So basically after a3, white is stopping the move bishop b4 check, which is pretty obvious and it is a good move. After a3, now it's time for us to set some deadly traps in the position. After a3, we are going to play the move b6. And now what's the idea? After b6, our idea is pretty logical. We want to develop the bishop via b7. And here, our opponent thinks that he got a tactic and he plays the move queen to d5. Trying to hit the knight as well as hitting the rook. And he's thinking that he simply won a piece. After queen d5, we are going to play the move knight to c5. And here our opponent simply captures the rook. And congratulations. Bishop to b7, attacking the queen. The queen is forced to capture the pawn. And after knight to c6, 
You won't believe it, but the queen is simply trapped. The queen is forced to capture the bishop, and we simply won the queen. So after knight f3, you can continue via knight f5, trying to sit on b3. So white plays knight d2, trying to cover this b3 square. Now we play queen e7, b4, but now knight into e5. If knight into e5, you can simply capture the knight, the rook is attacked, and once the rook moves, you can simply pull your knight back, the position is good. And if your opponent captures via b to a5, capturing the knight, simply knight to d3, check, your opponent cannot capture the knight because the pawn is pinned, so king d1, and now you can simply capture the f2 pawn, giving a check, and eventually capture the rook and win the game. If a6, you can simply play queen d8 and stop this pawn and you are eventually winning the game. So coming back, so that's exactly what happens if your opponent plays the move a3. So now let's try to discuss what happens if your opponent plays the move knight to f3. Which looks pretty obvious, he's simply focusing on developing his pieces. After knight f3, we have two options to continue the game. We can set a trap via b6. And here after b6, white goes for queen d5. We play the move bishop b7 this time. It is a very interesting move. After bishop b7, bishop queen takes, and now knight to c6. And the queen is actually trapped on the b7 square. Because after queen a6, bishop to b4 check. And the bishop b4 check is a very important move because it covers the e3 square. After bishop d2, you can simply play the move knight c5. And that's the whole point. If your bishop would have been on f8 and then you would have played the move knight c5, white is having the move queen a3. But in this position, the bishop is already covering, covering the square. So after knight c5, the queen is trapped. So after bishop takes, you can simply capture the queen. And if after knight c5, your opponent tries to move with the queen, simply capture the bishop, knight takes and pawn push. And the queen is trapped. You are simply winning the game. So this is what happens if your opponent plays the move queen to d5 in this position. And must remember move. In this position, if you try to go for knight c5, it's not really working. Because at the place of capturing the rook, your opponent will play the move knight to g5. Attacking the f7 pawn. And after you try to defend it, now white can happily capture the rook. Because after bishop b7, the knight is also hanging. The queen is not defending the knight. So that's the whole reason that you must play the move bishop to b7 in this position, attacking the queen. So this is a trap that you can play if you want. But the most suited plan in this position after knight f3 is to play the move bishop to b4 check. Why defends it via knight d2? You develop the knight to c6, simply focusing on developing. Your opponent cannot capture the knight because the knight is pinned. So after a3, you simply capture the knight with the knight. Bishop takes, bishop takes, queen takes, queen to e7. Queen to c3, trying to defend the e5 pawn. Short castle, and here our idea is to play the move rook e8 and triple attack this pawn. So white plays rook to d1, sensible move, rook e8 and trying to defend the pawn via rook to d5. After rook g5, now we continue the game via b6. e3, bishop b7, bishop e2, and now rook g 8 what black has done is completely common way to play, simply focusing on developing the pieces. And after rook d8, our opponent simply short castle. After short castle, now we have a great move in this position. You can try to pause the video and try to think in this position. Knight to b8. We simply attack the rook. The rook goes back and this time we can simply capture the knight. Bishop takes, queen takes pawn. Trying to attack the queen, and after rook c1, we can even trade off the queens and play the move d6 in this position. So, what's happening in this position? Material wise, we have an even position. It's a close position, so as you all guys know, that in close position, knight is much stronger than the bishop. But as the white squares are extremely weak, I think the position should be pretty much even, and it all comes down to the player who knows better in game. You can continue via a5, knight d7, knight c5, and you are having a pretty much decent position. So this is how you must play like 100% accurate chess if you want to play the move bishop before check. And it, is, and it is actually the best move. So this is how you must play if your opponent plays the move knight to f3. So now let's try to discuss what happens if your opponent goes for the move queen to c2. 
trying to attack the knight. We play bishop to b4 check, knight to c3, and here d5. What's the idea? Basically, our opponent wants to capture the knight with the queen, so we play the move d5 in order to, to protect the knight. And here, if e to d6, simply in passing, and now white's idea is still to capture the knight, here we can simply play the move bishop to f5. What's the idea, you ask? After bishop f5, our idea is to play the move knight g3, attacking the queen, at, uh, and at the same time, we are attacking the rook as well, and at the same time, we are also protecting with the bishop. So knight g3 is a very great move coming up. So white must move the queen, and if something like queen f4 check, we can simply play knight c6, and black is already, you, mu you won't believe it, but completely winning. Because after something like d into c7, queen f6. Bringing upon all your pieces into the game, knight into knight is coming up, which is unstoppable, and the position is completely winning for black. So this is how you can play your position if your opponent plays the move e into d6. So now let's try to discuss what happens if your opponent plays the move c into d5. After c into d5, we play the move queen into d5 because the knight is pinned. It cannot capture the knight or the queen because the knight is pinned up. So after queen into d5, bishop to d2 trying to remove the pin and now white is threatening to take the queen. So we play the move queen into d2 check. Queen d2, knight d2, queen king d2, and focus on developing our pieces via knight to c6, attacking the e5 pawn. White plays knight f3 to defend the pawn, and here we play the move bishop to g4. Our idea is to capture the knight as well as then followed by knight into e5. So white doesn't react to it because white can no longer protect the e5 pawn, so white plays e3, and now we can simply long castle, give a check. King moves to c2. Bishop to f5 check. e4, and now we can simply play the move bishop into c3. The point is, if you try to capture the bishop now, I can simply capture the e4 pawn. So you must capture the light square bishop, and here we can simply capture the e5 pawn, knight, and here after bishop c4, knight check, forcing a knight trade, bishop into f7, and here we have a very strong move, rook to d8. Doubling, doubling up the rook, and after bishop e6 check, king b8, Rook d1, I mean, and if we try to remove all the rooks, we get the b2 pawn, and in this position, what's happening here is, white is having 4 pawns on the king side, versus only 1 pawn on the queen side, whereas we are having 3 pawns on the queen side, so we are having queen side majority, so basically what you must do in this position is to simply put your bishop on f6, put your pawn on the light dark squares, and now then simply slowly and steadily start bringing your king on the queen side and try to push and eventually i would say practically what black is having a very decent chances to win the game so this is how you must play uh scene to d5 a very interesting way to play so this is how you must play if your opponent plays the move queen to c2 so now finally coming on to the last move which is knight to d2 how to play ask knight d2 the idea is pretty much clear White wants to trade off the knight without ruining his structure. So we play the move knight c5, keeping the knights on the board. What's the idea? Knight f3, we play the move knight c6. e3, trying to develop the pieces. And here we are going to shock our opponent via g5. Very strong move. What's the idea? After g5, we are saying that we want to play the move g4, hitting this knight. And once the knight moves away, then we are going to capture the e5 pawn. So in order to stop the move g4, white must play the move h3. And here we can simply develop via bishop g7, attacking the pawn on e5. And now white can't really defend the pawn because white won't be able to defend the pawn on e5 anymore. So white plays knight g4, trying to trade off the knights, and maybe the idea could be to sit on the f5 square, but we simply capture the pawn, knight to f3, trying to develop the pieces, but simply d6. Never trade your, ne never just go for the trade. If it is not compulsory, try to simply develop your pieces and allow your opponent to trade your pieces. d6, queen c2, the idea is to play the move knight f5, we play queen f6. Very interesting move. After queen f6, what's the idea? Black is having a very comfortable position. The idea is to play the move bishop d7, Long castle, 
and play on the king side via h5 g4. And black is having very interesting position. There's no problem in this position. Black is good to go. So this is how you can play this Budapest Gambit. And finally, we have covered all the variations. a3, f3, knight f3, knight d2, queen c2. Everything is covered under Budapest Gambit. And I hope that you guys must have learned something new today by watching this video. If you did, then make sure to like the video, share this video with everyone and make sure to beat your friends. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, make sure to subscribe to the channel. It's free for you, but it helps us to motivate us to make videos like this. So I'm going to see you soon. So chill then, stay tuned and keep watching One Shot Chess.